Thank you very much for the introduction and opportunity to be with you today. Let me just get to my presentation. and talk, talk about flooding, but not directly basement flooding, and bring into the, uh, into the consideration the, some of the issues that have been raised this morning as questions, and specifically talk about the climate change. As a background, uh, the, this talk is part of the much larger project that's been done with the support um, the City of London and uh, for the City of London under the title Assessment of the Infrastructure Vulnerability to Climate Change. And the results of the project have been presented to uh, the City. Uh, my understanding is that the City Council will be um, discussing recommendations of the project somewhere in June of this year. The project done before this one was the reassessment of the IDF curves for the City of London, taking into consideration the climate change uh, impacts, and the results of this assessment are also going to be presented to the Council next, next month. Work done on this project is the product of the number of people, and you can see I am very thankful for their help. This is an interdisciplinary team, uh, two universities, University of Western Ontario, University of Waterloo, and the number of people uh, uh, involved in the project are listed. I'd like to start my presentations with conclusions, so for those of you who would like to stretch maybe, this is it. <laughs> um, my key messages are that the urban environments and the infrastructure are vulnerable to climate change, and the fact is that adaptation cost uh, can, be, uh, can be very high. I am going to try and convey uh, through the presentation one idea that adaptation can be seen, adaptation to climate change can be seen as risk management. And the overall objective of this study was to develop the methodology for assessing the risk of climate change to, to infrastructure. And that kind of fits into, into this key, um, key message that we look at the adaptation as a risk management process. In order to do that, the, there is a very clear need for comprehensive risk assessment methodology um, that should kind of collect all the information, and evaluate the information, examine the information, in order to increase our understanding uh, of the relevant climate effects and their interactions with the different types of municipal infrastructure. The cost is rising by day. Uh, the cost to adaptation. And, and my final message is that the time to act is really now. Every, every day of delay is just going to increase the cost of adaptation. Um, the presentation is organized to kind of walk you through the project and present some of the results through the, of, of the case study. So I divided the presentation into two sections where I will be talking about the methodology. The first part, including climate modeling, hydrologic modeling, and hydraulic modeling, will be focusing on the assessments of the hazards and how it can be bring the climate change into that process. And then the second and more important is a presentation of the original methodology for assessing the risk to the infrastructure. And I'm going only to talk about the buildings in this particular presentation, in spite of the fact that projects involved uh, various types of infrastructure and the risk assessment. At the end, I'll present some of the results of the case study application for the City of London in an interview and conclude my presentation. So this is the kind of outline of the uh, work being done. 
As you can see, there were uh, two distinct parts of the overall process, the first one focusing on the hazards, and following with a bit more traditional uh, 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 traditional procedures that involve bringing the climate change impacts from the global scale to local, uh, uh, local scale, finding out how to convey and forward and uh, find out the, the find out how these climate uh, uh, local climate impacts are going to affect the infrastructure, and then we need a really uh, different way or the new way of assessing the risk to the infrastructure. And that's what I consider to be one of the major, actually there are two uh, important contributions. One contribution was how we brought the climate into the hazard analysis, and the second was how we developed this risk assessment and how this risk assessment has been done. Let me walk you through the uh, steps of the hazard analysis. The first idea, and this is already the innovative kind of view of bringing the climate change impacts, on down to the local scale was instead of selecting a particular uh, climate model, we decided to look at the broader range of broader range of possible impacts that climate change can bring to uh, the municipalities in this particular case to the to that to the municipality or the city of London. So instead of selecting one particular global climate models and finding ways how to downscale this information to the local scale, we looked at the broad range of various climate models, their potential impacts for this particular locality, and then identified two of them as a kind of uh, two scenarios that are determining the potential range of impacts. We, by doing this, we actually try to respond to the uncertainties that are involved with selection of the global climate model as well as the selection of the various scenarios that these models uh, require for the data. So we named them as the lower bound and upper bound kind of scenario, and both of them were, uh, both of them were then combined with the local information, or local observation, historical data, and the tool that downscales this global data to a local scale. These particular tools are known as the weather generators, and we use one. I'll tell you a little bit about the tool that can effectively do that following some kind of non preventive type of analysis. So the, the, the reason for selecting two scenarios is kind of presented here. This is only the presentation of one of the variables that the climate models, global climate models, provide, and 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 the. You, you cannot see the text. This is okay. These are the various models and the various uh, scenarios indicating that choice of the model and the scenario may actually result in a different value of the particular variable being uh, temperature, minimum, maximum, precipitation, mean precipitation, or whatever variable you're looking from the global um, model. So that, that motivated us to kind of look at the boundary uh, conditions. And as you can see, these red bars are indicated the choice of the two models that have been selected and used in the analysis for the city of London. This uh, information from the global models was down, downloaded for the location of the watershed. You're talking about Upper Thames River watershed within which the uh, city of London is located. City of London is under here. This watershed is about 3,500 square kilometers, and there are observations within and around the watershed that were useful to be combined with the global climate data that was provided only with one point uh, uh, in the region, and then processed through the weather generator to give us a long sequence of potential climates that may occur over the watershed. What you see on the right hand side is simply the animation of the results of this uh, uh, simulation. These, these are the potential precipitation patterns that may occur over the watershed over the long period of time. That was done for both uh, uh, scenarios, the lower and upper bound scenario in order to determine kind of range of potential impacts of climate change. This was the main input. This is the kind of climate analysis being done, and that provided the main input into much more traditional analysis in converting now this meteorological data into, uh, uh, into first hydrologic information, and then later on to the hydraulic analysis into inundation depth and extent and so on. 
So in the second step, we processed uh, the, the information through the hydrologic model. And this particular process was very much traditional. We utilized the model that's already being used by the Upper Times Conservation Authority. The only thing we have done, we, we kind of improved the resolution for the, for the uh, territory of the city. The reason being that uh, the model in the current form covers the whole watershed and therefore only 32 sub-basins are not sufficient for the detailed analysis that's required within the city. So we nested uh, another level of the hydrologic model with a much, uh, coarser, a much uh, more detailed resolution <coughs> within the territory of the city and used the existing model uh, as, a boundary, as a boundary conditions for the analysis of the analysis within the city. So this is the final form of the hydrologic model, and this hydrologic model allowed us now to transform uh, the information from the climate to climate scenarios into kind of hydrologic variables in this particular case, the runoff. And the runoff was estimated through the modeling exercise in the 169 locations uh, that were required for the detailed hydraulic analysis uh, within the city. The data from the <coughs> The, the, the outputs of the hydrologic model were processed using traditional uh, traditional statistical analysis. What you see here are the kind of probability of the uh, 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 flows at particular location for the two scenarios. And now the question was, how are we going to use this information in order to proceed with the further uh, to proceed further with the hydraulic analysis and the assessment of the impacts. So through the communication and work uh, with the engineers in the City of London, we opted, uh, with the involvement of the people from the Upper Thames Conservation Authority, we opted for two regulatory floods. And using the, basically the statistical information uh, obtained after the hydrologic modeling, we found corresponding uh, 100 and 250 year floods and now we had uh, two climate scenarios, upper and lower bound, and two hydrologic scenarios, 100 and 250 year, to proceed to proceed with. This information, as I said, was generated at 169 points around the city, and then the very traditional hydraulic analysis was used to convert the runoff or the flows into into potential impacts, basically the inundation uh, uh, inundation. The type of model uh, being used is the Hydrologic Engineering Center uh, River Analysis System that was used uh, in the, with, together with the GIS uh, pre-processing and uh, post-processing tool. And that particular analysis gave us something like this. Basically, the extent of the inundation uh, that corresponds to the four scenarios, two climate and two hydrologic scenarios. And the shade of blue was basically the uh, uh, depth of inundation at different locations. So this was, the, this was the outcome of the hazard analysis. So these maps were generated for the whole territory of the city and for four different uh, scenarios. We were able to analyze different locations. We were able to kind of compare, for example, the extent of the inundation corresponding to one climate scenario with another. Uh, we were able to compare, for example, the extent of the inundation uh, compared to existing, uh, to existing conditions, which are called the kind of historic conditions, in order to see what are the variations that the climate change will bring at the different locations. That was the main input into the risk assessment. And the risk assessment methodology was detailed uh, was developed to kind of basically introduce the non-traditional way of looking the uh, risk of flooding as the product of the probability of hazard and the consequences. And the consequences were uh, are kind of combining the economic information or the monetary value and uh, as I'm going to talk a little bit more about various kind of aspects of the potential consequences for flooding. So the process took the, the, the basically inundation, inundation maps for all these four scenarios and that the probability values associated with these different scenarios 
where the measures of the hazard or the probability of the particular uh, particular event. Uh, the, the, the data that was combined with this information, with the hazard information, in this particular case I'm focusing only on buildings, um, was provided by the City of London. We included commercial, industrial, institutional, and residential buildings. And the area uh, that was covered by the uh, inundation extent for this whole scenario included more than 120,000 uh, uh, 120, buildings. We also um, integrated in the risk assessment process the traditional economic information stage damage curves. They're provided by the Ministry of Natural Resources and also some uh, uh, curves were developed for the, for the types of infrastructure that they were not available. And finally, the detailed economic data about each property within the city was provided from the uh, Municipal Property Assessment Corporation that basically handles and manages all the economic data for the, for the city of London. So using this detailed information, we were able to assess the risk and quantify also the risk impact, uh, indicate what is the contribution of the climate change, and compare, uh, compare the potential impacts, uh, uh, taking into consideration this range of two scenarios that I described at the beginning. Since the main purpose of doing this risk assessment was to, us, to kind of assist uh, 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 city council in making decisions, prioritizing, uh, and understanding better risk, we decided to very carefully plan how are we going to present the information, calculate the risk for each of these 120,000 pieces of uh, infrastructure will be very hard to convey to city council if you would like to develop the broader understanding, you know, what is the level of risk, where is this risk kind of occurring within the territory of the city, and how should we prioritize that. So we decided to uh, present this in a particular form uh, using the spatial kind of division of the city territory, and we selected dissemination areas, the way how the city is basically the uh, area divided. Um, and this particular uh, form is, I think, originates from the Canada Post and, and identifies the areas uh, with the uh, equal number or very close number of the population density. So, so as you can see, you may have a very large uh, dissemination, uh, dissemination <coughs> units somewhere outside where the density is not very high compared to very small units uh, um, uh, that are indicating higher density of population. So dissemination areas were now uh, uh, represented the main spatial unit within which each uh, uh, infrastructure or all the elements of the infrastructure are, an are analyzed. And for each of the dissemination areas, the total risk was assessed or calculated so that we can represent that the risk in the uh, uh, kind of graphical form on the maps uh, that are going to be easier I think, to communicate the message of risk. When you look at the buildings, and, and uh, I'm including here also critical facilities, um, uh, there are different ways and, and, and kind of uh, mechanisms that they will fail to flooding, and mostly the damage may occur to the structure, in some cases the content, um, and also the aspects of evacuating people uh, is associated with the location of the building and the potential impact that one may have on the particular building. For the critical facilities, including uh, police stations, fire stations, hospitals, schools, and so on, you look a little bit more, you look also the uh, besides the structure, equipment, and context, we also look at the, the service and, and what these particular facilities may not be able to provide in the case if they are flooded. Okay, so the first step was assessing the probability of hazard, and that was relatively easy, just presenting in the uh, um, kind of spatial form our inundation. So what you see here are these four different scenarios these are just the kind of schematic representations of the inundation areas for the uh, climate change lower bound, 100 year term period scenario, climate change upper bound, 100 and 250 uh, lower and upper bound. 
So these were the four main inputs provided by the hazard analysis. And obviously, depending on the 100 or 250 years, they were carrying the different, uh, different probability. The second step was to look at the consequences from flooding. And this is where we did something, uh, um, so we, we, I think we innovated a little bit the procedure. Um, the, the, the consequences were um, calculated using the three different multipliers, loss of function, equipment, and loss of structure in order to reflect you know, the role that different uh, infrastructure buildings are serving and in order to kind of capture all possible failure uh, modes that these different uh, structures may experience. What was interesting that some of these uh, we were able to assess relatively easily. Loss of function or equipment was on the kind of binary, in the binary mode, occurring or not occurring being zero or one. However, uh, uh, s s some other aspects may require uh, um, very detailed economic information, inundation information, and possibly even the subjective information on the perception of risk that may come from those who are using these different infrastructure components. The, the, the procedure was relatively, I mean, simple presentation of the procedure is here. So the flood planes or the maps that were indicating the extent and the depth of inundation were integrated with the aerial photography and the detailed information provided about all the buildings uh, and then combined with the stage damage uh, uh, information or the economic data provided for that so that, that, that the whole process then ended up with the uh, calculated risk for each piece of infrastructure that was clearly located at a particular location within the city. Um, this is just a kind of uh, uh, indication how this was done. You can see, for, for example, a small section. This is the downtown area um, where the North Thames joins the South Thames and continues to extend. Uh, the shade of blue indicates the depth uh, of inundation. You can see the scale. And the location of each building was very clearly kind of identified with the geographic information uh, systems and the data provided as a, uh, GIS layers. We were able to kind of now compare the de depth to the basically location of the building and identify the inundation of each building. How deep water was at a particular uh, at a particular location and then using the damage uh, stage damage curves find out the corresponding corresponding damage so for the selected or identified that we were able to find out the damage and that was the key piece of information in proceeding with the calculation of risk and that was a deterministic, or what I say, a really quantitative type of analysis. This is relatively traditional, except that we looked at three different aspects of uh, uh, potential damage. What I think was new is we tried to combine now this information, especially when we are talking about loss of structure, with some um, subjective type of information that the stage damage curve does not make a major difference between the one-story building built uh, uh, two years ago versus one-story building built 100 years ago. Uh, the same stage damage curve is provided by the ministry that corresponds to one-story uh, uh, type of building. So what we try to do is now, from the direct knowledge and interviews with the people as well as the people in the city to take the subjective information how much this will be modified how much the damage will be modified based on the let's say age of the building type of the material being used particular maintenance if you're talking about some municipal buildings and so on and that was done through the introduction of the totally new kind of theoretical concepts of the fuzzy sets where you can relatively easily transfer this subjective information into some kind of quantitative type of analysis where the, 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 the current state uh, the current state or the acceptable state is defined with one of the so-called membership functions and the critical uh, state with another and the overlapping area identifies a kind of level uh, level of that subjective risk that will be going then and combined with the uh, uh, with the 
quantitative data uh, generate the overall overall risk to different infrastructure elements. At the end, we use the kind of monetary values. Uh, they were basically dollar values associated with different uh, particular uh, building types or infrastructure elements, and that they all combined into a relatively simple uh, but complex relationship that brings now the probability of hazard, uh, the different type of impact, and the monetary value together, and calculates that value for each element of it, for each building, for each element of the infrastructure. Um, the, 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 the calculation is then being uh, kind of transferred, or the information is being transferred into maps by integrating or by simply adding the risk value within each of the dissemination units with the, by identifying simply how many of the buildings and which are within particular dissemination units. Let me show you some of the results for the city of London. That was the methodology. We applied this methodology from the beginning, the hazard analysis to the risk assessment uh, to the city of London. We didn't look only buildings. I'm going to show you some results only for the buildings. We looked nine types of infrastructure, much larger number of infrastructure uh, pieces and elements, and we assessed the total risk because that was the objective of the study. The table, tables and maps were produced for these four different like, criteria, sorry, climate scenarios, two lower and upper bound and 100 and 250 year return period. And we were requested also to utilize the information that was representing the kind of historical or the, uh, the, the current level of damage. Um, I have a reservation of kind of comparing these uh, because we are talking about apples and oranges. The way how, for example, maps are developed here and inundation uh, is very, very different, done a very long time ago, and does not correspond to kind of methodology that we have done uh, and implemented in this process. But it is an important piece of information so that we can somehow uh, compare the current state with the potential impact that the climate change can impose on the, on the city. Uh, the maps were used to identify the areas of high risk. And this is just giving you, for example, the, the, the extent of the inundation for different climate scenarios, the number of buildings within a number of critical facilities. So that's all what was done in order to, in order to generate this final information. And as, as I explained, then from the tables for each element of the infrastructure, we went into dissemination units or dissemination areas we added all the information to come up with a level of risk that will correspond for, to this particular spatial location, for this particular dissemination area. So at the end, we were able to produce map like this, where the shades of red are indicating the extent of the risk, that, that kind of uh, total risk. And this map is created basically by plotting the information for each dissemination area. Here are some of the results and why these maps are useful. Um, these are, well, this is the counted year lower bound scenario. And you, you can see, actually, you cannot see much. <laughs> the resolution is not extremely, extremely good. But for some of you from London, you may recognize particular areas. It was very clear that these darker red areas are the areas of high risk. And these are the areas that we kind of identify. One is on the Portland Creek where there is a particular culvert under the, under the railway that creates the backup effect and we found that for the larger flooding that may be the consequence of climate change a considerable, a considerable area will be flooded as a consequence of, of insufficient capacity of this culvert. The second location was the location of the Rockdale Dyke uh, which does not have sufficient height to uh, uh, respond to the impact of the climate change and the area behind the dike uh, uh, will be affected in this case by the lower bound climate scenario uh, to this level. Um, the third area identified is the area of coves, which is a very known area, mostly trailer park basically, where lots of, uh, 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 lots of people may be affected, uh, lower income type of area and, and very, very vulnerable socially. Similar maps, where you know we were now able to generate the maps for all the scenarios: upper bound, 
200 years, uh, 250 lower bound, 250 upper bound. And having all these maps, now we were able actually to do the various analysis, uh, uh, the kind of comparisons. Uh, we were able to, for example, compare the historic information with the climate change uh, information. And that was done by comparing these two 250 uh, uh, year maps. So we were able to say, for example, what is the contribution of the climate change uh, uh, to uh, potential uh, increase in risk in risk of life. I can tell you that the total number is for the whole territory of the city about 78 percent. Uh, then we were able to analyze, you know, uh, uh, the different different uh, do different comparisons in order to answer some different questions that the uh, uh, city councilors may have. One was, for example, the analysis of the hundred year uh, uh, event and the comparison of the lower and upper bound, and that kind of comparison gives you the, the sense of the uncertainty or the impact of that range of the two climate scenarios that upper and lower bound that we were using. So that was a very important piece of information to say, okay, so how large is that uncertainty? How large is the potential impact that may come from choosing different uh, climate model or different climate scenario? Then we were able to do some kind of comparison. 250 is the regulatory flight, 100 years is the regulatory flight. Uh, in our legislation, that kind of carries a certain particular message. And now it was very interesting to see how these are going to be affected by the climate change impact and possibly generate some recommendations that may, uh, that may go into, uh, into change of the, of the regulations and so on. So these are really the types of comparisons. These comparisons can be shown again in the uh, uh, cartographical form. What you see here in the different colors is actually now the difference, the percent difference in this between the, uh, between the two compare scenarios. So, so the answers to some of the questions that are posed by setting this analysis of scenarios were at the end answered by generating maps, maps like this. <coughs> In addition to presenting the maps, we are now able to actually go straight into each of these dissemination units and use the information, the GIS information available, and, and clearly see what are the what are the consequences, what are the impact. For example, you know, in some of the analysis, we identify particular cells or particular dissemination areas. We, we can identify them in the, on the map. This is the, 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 the Potters Group Creek and the Calvert that I mentioned. And this is the comparison of the 200 year lower bound and 100 year upper bound scenario. And you, see, you can see the impacts of this backup effect extremely seriously affecting the, the population in this area. <coughs> and that's, that's now possible. You can actually see exactly where the, the, the red spots are, where the areas of high risk are. And you can also find out what is the level of risk, what is contributing to that particular level of risk, so what are the pieces of infrastructure being flooded here, and then you know, prioritize your adaptation options or adaptation uh, uh, policies. Similar thing, this is the downtown area, um, also another sensitive area. We have a dike here, and this dike provides the protection, but not for the conditions under the climate change. And you can see, actually, this is more yellow than this. If the uh, flows that the climate change scenarios are bringing occur, the whole area behind this dike may be, may be affected, which is a pretty serious, you know, pretty serious uh, risk to the city. And so on. This is another example where we have the, uh, one of the critical infrastructure, the, the, the particular uh, high school, sorry, the school, and, and yellow and blue are showing the kind of difference between the two climate scenarios, which does not look in the extent of inundation significant, but in the depth, the, the, the difference is considerable, and therefore the damage of, you know, to this particular critical infrastructure type is, is pretty serious. So you have option now that, you know, from the map that kind of provides the overall allocation of risk, and then, you know, look into the details, identify what are the pieces of infrastructure, and select the adaptation, adaptation uh, box. This is a very kind of quick walk through the uh, uh, detailed process that we implemented in the City of London in this particular study. And I'll repeat the messages. I think it's very clear that in this particular case, urban 
uh, environment uh, in infrastructure in the city of London is vulnerable to climate change. And we looked only one particular impact. We looked only the river uh, uh, flooding that may come from the rivers that are going through the city. We also have all the figures that are indicating the cost. I'm not allowed to use the figures and tell them publicly yet until they go to the uh, city council. I've been criticized because I was doing that in my previous presentations. But I can tell you that the cost of you know, potential flooding that these two scenarios are bringing up very, 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 very high for the, for the, for the city of 370,000 people. Uh, I am, I, I am, I am strongly, I'm strongly suggesting that we will not be able to eliminate the risk. It is very clear that simply the extent of the risk is so high and the capacity of the municipality is uh, uh, exceeded many times. So we will need to find a way to actually adapt to that risk. And that will, I think, utilize the information from the study like this, where you can see and understand what is the level of risk, where it is located, and then derive and find out what will be the best adaptation policy that can match the available resources. I think we, through this study, provided this comprehensive methodology. This methodology now can be applied in any, I think, municipality. In any, I'm not saying this is the way to do it. I'm saying this is one way uh, to do it, to do this analysis. But I think uh, uh, the, the results are kind of justifying and providing providing useful information to those who may need this and use this information. And again, to repeat, I feel that you know. Uh, the changes are occurring. Everyone who talked this morning and before me already pointed out that you in your municipalities are seeing the change, facing the problems, dealing with these problems, and kind of delaying, the, delaying to include the climate change into this analysis, I think will just increase, increase the cost of the future, uh, future <coughs> adaptation. With this, thank you very much for your attention. I'm not sure, do I have any questions? Yeah, you have time. Okay, so we have some time for questions. I'll be very happy to answer. Let me tell you that all the, uh, the this whole study, we have a number of reports, um, a lot of results and a lot of models available. And the easiest way to go is to my website, click on research, and this is the name of our facility, and then projects. And then you will see under the title uh, the, the, the project that's related to the city of London. And then within that area, within that web page, we have all the all the information, and that's all available because that was the research project done uh, with the support of the city. Questions? Go ahead. Hi there. Uh, I'm Renee Hepburn Rickett with the Insurance Bureau of Canada, and I'm here to just wondering if you have thought about doing a cost-benefit analysis where you talk about potential adaptation measures and then talk about the potential cost versus you're saying they're very high. Yeah. I'm assuming that any sort of adaptation would have some sort of benefit. That's a great question and a very logical next step. Yeah. And uh, uh, we, as a, since I'm coming from the university and the institute, and I, I was involved with the research project, we will not be doing that. But one of the very strong recommendations provided to the city is to proceed with the very detailed stuff. Because they will need, uh, they, they, they will need to reduce the number of options, oh, sorry, to, they, they will have only a limited number of options to consider, <coughs> um, budgets and everything. Uh, everything else is limiting that set of options. And finding out which one is the, 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 the best one to proceed or to somehow prioritize, I don't think that the risk is the only objective or the only criteria they should use. Uh, we did some uh, preliminary analysis by bringing in some social information that's available for the same dissemination areas from the Stats Canada. So we brought the income, the gender, the you know various other impacts, and then looked at the same dissemination areas according to this being only one criteria and adding all other criteria: income, number of you know uh, female, number of single families, and so on. And I can tell you that immediately the picture changes. So the areas that were red, when you look at only the risk to infrastructure, were not anymore. That Cove's area carries a very heavy social vulnerability. When you bring the criteria that are reflecting the social vulnerability, that particular area jumps, you know, in the, and that's, 
That's something that I think we strongly recommend. We have about 30, 36 recommendations divided in three groups that the city is considering. And one of them is to proceed with a detailed economic analysis, benefit cost, but also we are strongly, we are strongly advocating incorporation of the social, social vulnerability together with the economic and the risk. Any other questions? Did I overlook you? <laughs> Lots of information in a short period of time. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Going back to the climate change, one argument that's come out is that, and in in going back to the same show, you showed a 100 year frame and you showed a 250 year frame. Well, there weren't a lot of people in London, Ontario 250 years ago. And again, what data do we have to put in pick? And another argument that's come up is yes, we're uh, going through climate change, but is this just another cycle that the Earth has gone through for, of course, hundreds of thousands of years? Okay. Um, I, 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 I need about two hours to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> but I have the presentation that answers these questions. Okay, so the first statement, 100 and 250 years, wrongly interpreted. I'm talking about 100 year return period. So this is a statistical measure of the probability of flow that occurs once in a hundred, or every year with the probability of one over 100. Okay, so we're not talking about 250 years back or 100 years back. The, the issue of the climate change, existence of the climate change or non-existence of climate change was beyond this particular study. Um, I, am, I think there is a very strong scientific consensus that clearly uh, documenting that the, our climate is changing. Uh, the key uh, debate or disagreement is in the area who is contributing to that. Are we contributing to this change or this is something that comes from the natural cycling? And I think this is irrelevant. The fact is that the climate is changing. We are seeing more frequent uh, extremes. We are seeing increase in temperature. There are observations of the last year was the warmest year on record, historical record, and talking about global uh, data. We have a permanent and very strong increase in the concentration of the greenhouse gases. Uh, so only the observations, the measurements, are very clearly indicating that there is a change. Um, I really don't think that we have time to, you know, hold on and discuss who is guilty, and because the cost, the cost is fine and it's going to affect all of us. Great presentation. Thanks. So you, you spawned two questions. Follow up on the first question. It seemed to me that based on the work that you've done, you've identified what would appear to be some low-hanging fruit, mm -hmm. and that is some hydraulic bottlenecks with respect to the sizing of culverts. Have you done any analysis to demonstrate what level of risk reduction you would achieve if those culverts were properly sized for the kinds of storms that you've modeled? And then the corollary to all of this is to what extent has this work informed the work of the Conservation Authority, which has the overarching responsibility on flood yeah. management? Great question. Uh, okay, so first question we didn't do. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, the, 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 the project, you know, the project was supported to develop the risk assessment methodology and perform the risk assessment. The adaptation, now the, the basically selection of the adaptation options and all other, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, choices that city will have in order to deal with that level of risk is in their hands. Uh, the second one is the Upper Thames Conservation Authority was uh, involved very closely with the project. Um, they, the, the city was the main uh, funding source and they actually raised that interest and this is why they were kind of pushing us to look at the infrastructure, municipal infrastructure, but uh, Upper Thames Conservation Authority really helped, especially with the, the hazard analysis. And we also, on their request, extended and used some of these results to do some little bit more detailed analysis for the whole Upper Thames uh, uh, watershed to look at the kind of seasonal impact uh, and, and, and analyze you know, the impact on idea <coughs> for them and, and to answer some more detailed questions that are within the responsibility of the Upper Thames Conservation Authority for flood management in the whole basin. They're very much interested in the questions of possibly addressing the, the change of the regulation and you know what needs to be done, what would be the consequences and how. So 
they are they were part of it. Unfortunately, they didn't have financial resources, for example, to continue with a much more detailed study. And I think in this case, city really provided the leadership and had the resources to actually do this and help also, I think, the, 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 what the other than conservation authority is responsible for. Uh, any other questions? Thank you very much. <laughs>